Thanks for tuning in to the Pace Performance Podcast. So a long overdue part two with Ben Ashworth. So welcome to the podcast again, mate. Yeah, thanks for having me. It was 2017. Uh, I looked it up and uh, yeah, so it's been a long time. It was. I didn't actually look that up, but I guessed it was about two and a half years. Something like that. Yeah, it's bang, it's bang on. It's bang was on. It? Was it actually? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, nice. Exactly. So lots changed. Different country. Different job. Yeah. Different role. Yeah. So, super exciting. Yeah, right. Super exciting. So last time we spoke, you were at the Physio, Physio Arsenal. Where are you now? Just want to give us a bit of background on how that, well, we'll go into how that happened, the changes and all that kind of thing. But yeah, what happened before Arsenal, Arsenal, and then where you are now? Okay, yeah, sure. So the background is basically, well, I'm 23 years qualified as a physio this year and 18 of those have been working in elite sport. And I started with a great job in my favourite sport at the time, which was rugby. And I worked London Wasps for three years. Those years sort of passed me by, really, um, enjoying winning a lot, going out with some some really good, uh, really good players and some of my heroes. Um, but then I sort of had to get down to it a little bit. And I went to the British Olympic Association where I worked with loads of different athletes from different sports. Um, lucked out a little bit with a job leading the EIS team in London um, before, it was about 2007, so just before Beijing. Uh, again, a fantastic team to work with, loads of brilliant physios and S&C coaches. That then led me into a job which I took up from one of my staff who left and I was the British judo physio in the lead up to uh, the London Olympics. Right. And the reason why I meant, yeah, yeah. The reason why I mentioned that is because as part of the role sort of leading the team, my ambition was to go to the Olympic Games. So to, to latch on to a team was really important to me. And actually I lucked out with the team because, you know, we might talk about it later, but it was shoulder injury heavy. Um, not that that's a good thing, but it meant that I had to get pretty good at sh- pretty good at shoulders pretty quickly. And then um, a complete right, hard right turn after the Olympics and was, again, lucky to, very fortunate for someone outside football to, to be given the job at Arsenal. So then six very good years, uh, enjoyable years at Arsenal. Uh, finished in 2018 when Ars- Arsene F- Wenger finished. And I had a personal development, uh, almost a year actually, where I was setting up my own business, uh, Athletic Shoulders, and uh, doing some consultancy and going to meet people I've, I'd wanted to meet for a long time for my own personal development. Started a PhD. Um, and yeah, that's brought us up to almost the, the moment we're at now. And I, I took the job in Sparta, out in Prague, last March. And I've been here now just over just over a year. Yeah, I remember speaking to you in that transition after leaving Arsenal, and you were going all over the place. What did you cherry pick where you were going? Did you get requests? Was there any? Yeah, what I'm trying to get is was there any real plan in terms of a personal professional development checklist that you wanted to go and and uh, and check off? Yeah. Um... I think it was, you know, a, a voyage. People, people always say, oh, you know, if you're in the if you're in the area, just pop in. And you're never going to be in New York. Or you're <laughs> never going to be in you know, San Diego or wherever, wherever it was. So I was I built a nice network through Arsenal and through people like Daniel Cohen, who's connected to everyone. And he connected me to Tim Pello, who's connected to everyone. So I literally organized a West Coast tour and it took in the Navy SEALs. U.S. Olympic Committee, the L.A. Rams, the 49ers, the Sharks, Kelly Starrett. Uh, you know, I just had a go. And then um, you know, there was some sort of personal development that was directed more towards shoulders. Um, but often I went into organizations, understood what they were doing with regard to shoulder issues. But then we would talk about other things like from Arsenal days and other problems around monitoring, maybe, and just just share, giving and sharing. Um and it was a nice period because it was non-threatening. I wasn't, you know, trying to take any money off people. I literally was was able to fund my own personal development and pay for my own ticket and 
and yeah, and, and do some great learning. So it was, it was a fantastic time. Mm-hmm. And the transition from into into um, into Sparta Prague, how did that come around? I've just been on a, a webinar about relationship building and you know all that kind of stuff. So it fits right in with yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's good. Yeah, I mean, you know, there's no secret. The kind of my sporting director is um, Thomas uh, Rosicki or Tom Rosicki as the English football public would know him as. And um, he came out here a year before and became the sporting director in the August um, before I before I joined the club. And I was his, you know, kind of go to person at Arsenal on a day to day basis in the last couple of years. And we just spoke about loads of stuff and built a really good relationship. And OK, there's friendship there, but there's also some sticky, sticky patches, you know, and, and needing to be really honest and brutal with each other at times. So I think we just went through those those phases and just built a very strong trust. And um, so when they were looking for someone, actually, they reached out to me to help them find someone. Uh, you know, it wasn't a direct request because he didn't think I'd come. Um, and so because he knew I was, you know, pretty much enjoying my year uh, and I'd set up my own business. Um, so then a few conversations later and permission from my wife and I, I started in I started in March and it was literally the beginning of March. We went on a skiing holiday and then at the end of March, I was out here um, just to sort of see out the last eight weeks of the season and just have a surveillance period to see what was going on what needed change changing or you know what the lay of the land was out here before we had this sort of break in the summer so we could come back ready to start this season so your family's still in england are they with you yeah they're they're in the uk um i've got an eight-year-old girl and eight-year-old daughter and she's happy and my wife's comfortable where they are they live in quite close to chelsea's training ground in cobham and you know, life's good for them, good network. And we have we did six months to see how it was and everything was fine and we're coping well. And then we see each other when we can. Well, pre pre this time, we saw each other whenever we needed to. Uh, it's a little bit different now, but yeah, it's um, it, it, it's going OK. I think um, it probably benefits my marriage, me being away. <laughs> so, <laughs> Because you know, yeah. it's it's often on the on the bucket list for every strength and conditioning coach, physio, anyone in that kind of behind this behind the scenes uh, support staff to tick that box to uh, to work overseas. Normally, probably in America or Australia, um, maybe not the Czech Republic. But even so, how how hard that transition been, especially with your family at home? Even if your family were there, I guess it's still quite a tough a tough transition. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I've got a super su- supportive family and that's been my life since they've known me, you know. So um, I had six years at Arsenal where I didn't see them. I saw I saw the players more than more than I saw my family, really. And that was that was the important bit about having a year almost away from it. Um, in terms of the co- like the transition to a new country, you know, if the first language is English, it's a start. Yeah. So <laughs> and people don't even realise that. But when I tell them that the meetings are in Czech, um, you know, and, and players, generally speaking, most of them, the majority of them speak reasonable English, but it's not a, it's not a common you know, language like you, if you were going to Holland or to Germany. Um, meetings are primarily in Czech. Mm-hmm. So that, if you think about trying to influence change in a new environment, then you're not just relying on you know, your ability to influence, you're also relying on making sure that you capture a lot of the detail that gets lost in in translation. And it's exactly as it says, you know, lost in translation. So you can send reports, you can Google Translate, you can do what you like to try and bridge the gap. But, you know, spending time with coaches and being able to have conversations until you go to a place where you can't you can't speak the language. You don't really realize how how um how flexible you have to be and how Mm. kind of you know how on top of everything you need to be so i think taught me a lot about taught me a lot about certainly influence and influencing Mm. styles and i've you know i i have a check lesson every wednesday um you know and and that's not because i 
going to speak fluent Czech in the next couple of years, but it's because I'm in a Czech country and I need to try and meet them, you know, halfway. The players who come here also, they try and learn Czech um, to try and show that they're, you know, want to be a part of something, part of the culture. So it's important. So that brings you nicely onto the transition from Physio Arsenal to a director of performance role. Do you still do hands-on work or is that, are you just advising and overseeing at the minute? Yeah, so when, after my year, after my kind of almost a year away from, from physio, I did some physio stuff and some rehab stuff. I mean, part of my background is, you know, masters in SNC and UKSCA accreditation as well. So that kind of all encompassing work with individuals was, was something that I was still doing before I came out here. But I didn't want to come here and be working in the team. I wanted to be working on the team and, and to do that there's there's this necessary sort of detachment you've got to be available and remain available but i didn't want to start coming in and and um imposing my thought processes on you know especially the physio team but it, it, you know the snc coaches as well it was important to allow them time to um show that they were capable of of delivering in terms of the sort of standards that we would set. Um, and if I was jumping in every two seconds, it would it would certainly impede impede that development. So, um, yeah, where I've, I think I've put a hand on maybe three players in the last 14 months. Mm. Um, but I would say I'm, I'm very kind of uh, visible um, around the place. You know, I'm not sitting in a in an ivory tower i'm uh, on the ground every day on the pitch in the gym we meet regularly we discuss cases together the physios probably feel a bit of pressure but uh that's not a bad thing but they're they're all sort of stepping up to the plate which is which is good is there anything that you've had to learn quick on the job in terms of being in that managerial position or do you think you you'd set yourself up to have a reasonably smooth transition into that yeah, the background I had was I worked in a team of leaders. You know, there were a lot of people at Arsenal who were first team physio by by name under the, you know, under the guidance of Colin Lewin, who was our boss. And um, but, you know, as he said, he, he brought in people who were autonomous practitioners who were already at a level that had led teams in the past. So when you sat there in the morning and you were in a physio role, you understood your your position and you know the requirements to feed information to Colin to enable him to do his job to you know from the medical team perspective and how you interacted with the other departments but if you've got anything about you you sit there and you go well I don't think I'd do it like that what would I do if I was in a head of performance role or what would I do if I you know there were some disagreements as there should be in in good teams um but you learn so much in a in an organization like that about how it all interacts you spend time delving into GPS that you probably should have got home already, but you're <laughs> so focused on one player and the fact that he did 60 metres more sprint distance than he should today. And you're currently working with him on his hamstring, you know. So that was a sort of microscopic view of life. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, to sort of answer the question is I felt very prepared to take the next step up. And I think the, the beauty of it was that I I didn't go in terms of a linear career progression from a first team physio to then a head of department to then spend a couple of years doing that, maybe even at an equivalent or lower level than Arsenal and then try to transition up. I think that would have been detrimental to my career progress. And I, I knew I didn't want to go back and influence just the small things. I wanted to influence the big things mm -hmm. and uh, yeah. That was that was the key behind not taking jobs and opportunities that came my way within that nine month period and actually hold out for the right the right challenge. Mm -hmm. I spoke to Jason Weber at Fremantle a few weeks ago and he's been high performance manager there for, I don't know, 12, 15 years, whatever it is. And he was talking about how you don't need to understand all the intricacies within people's roles, whether it be a the machine learning um coding all these kind of things you don't have to understand them in depth but when somebody talks in their language you have to, you can't be sat there with a glum look on your face you've got to have that basic understanding 
is that something yeah. that you're getting to grips with in terms of them more i suppose specialist skills that maybe you don't learn through the traditional or traditional pathway what was 10 15 20 years ago yeah i mean currently and i was i sort of decided to do this um was a lot of it our ceos wants to be very data driven um and i i'm you know people who know me probably or people who don't know me probably think i'm just a numbers person so it sort of suits me um that said I've been working in the trenches, you know, with the with the filter, with the interpret. I was the filter. I was the interpreter of the information, you know, separating out the noise. Um, so w what I've done recently is I've, I'm actually doing currently a certificate at um, Cambridge Judge just in, uh, you know, business analytics, um, looking at data interpretation and, and that side of it um, so that, you know, talking about machine learning and AI and, and, and all of these other things. Um, you know, I can have a decent conversation with someone. I, I recognize my own limitations, but, you know, I can be across it and I can be asking questions across it. So I, I totally agree with that. Um, similar thing around S&C coaching. I'm not an S&C coach, but I've done my time and I've not only formally qualified, but also worked with some really, really top people who, who I still ask questions of now in my network. You know, so being across that whole spectrum is is vital. And originally it was being across physio and S&C because that was my that was my day to day was trying to work on, you know, building robust athletes and trying to, uh, you know, make sure that there was no detriment to performance. But now it's it's OK. Is there something else that can help our team? You know, is there information that we could we can hack to try and get a competitive advantage? Yeah. So that business analytics, there's no, there's no link in that course to sport. It's just within itself. But obviously, you're going to link it to sport. But the, the course itself, I mean. Yeah, it's. it's I mean, it's pretty. It's pretty. Hard. I was doing it till one p. One, 1 a.m. last night because I yeah. got interested in it. But it, it's um, you know, decision trees and you know, products and uh, and some case studies from different areas. So, yeah, how how do you that the beauty of doing something like that, like any course, is if you're actually solving problems at the same time in your own workplace and then you read a book, listen to a podcast or do a course and it's it's applicable, then then it, it it's fantastic for that. So, mm -hmm. you know, I, I spoke to I spoke to Joe Club at Buffalo, mm -hmm. um, you know, and about their resources and their data science that they can utilize to answer some of their questions. And if you think about a lot of the work that I've done over over the years, it's all, all been kind of a dumbed down version of science. You know, it might be regression, it might be linear relationships. It's not talking about kind of, you know, these these higher powered data science functions that I think are really, really important to understand and, and understand their, their, their place, understand their limitations. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. So just getting the physio director of performance hat back on in a in a day to day workings, I suppose. In terms of culture and beliefs and way people work, how does that differ from the UK to to the Czech Republic and how they go about things, how they see things from a I suppose a clinical and just use an example return to play uh, point of view. Yeah, I mean, again, I've only I've been at one football club in the UK, Arsenal. Yeah. I've been at one football club in the Czech Republic, so it might be a generalisation. But um, I think what I found when I came, um, and this is not this is not uh, intended to be a criticism, but there's some good work going on. You know, people talk about silos, but there's some good work going on. There's maybe a different skill set and different um, ideas and concepts over here and in, in particularly around the physio area there might be there's a, a local guru who looks at you know developmental patterning and so a lot of the preparation exercise will use this kind of deve development mental patterning work and that's really interesting and and probably achieves the same outcome from a different a different route um but what what they perhaps didn't have here was this connection this kind of idea of this interdisciplinary 
team you know my my role is the only one of its kind in in the czech republic so it sort of shows you that no one really knew what to expect and you know from a point of view of just simple stuff around communication channels that you and i would probably take for granted um they needed some guidance and direction to bring everything together into one place and to create transparency of information you know um for the benefit of the of the of the players and the benefit of the information that passes to the coaching team so you know certainly the level of practitioner um is is good but how they interact as a performance team was that was the difference yeah that's really interesting just writing them writing them notes down to make sure i, I remember that Maybe some things that the less sexy stuff, I guess, when somebody says, oh, I'm moving to be director of high performance, like what's the first thing you do if you go, well, I'm going to sort out the transparency of, of information and, and the communication channels. But that is the reality <laughs> of, of moving into that type of job in, in a country where it, that role is in its infancy. So not to get too deep into the weeds, but what does that look like in terms of them two things, the communication? and the transparency of info what what is improving what was it like and what are you trying to move it towards well yeah i, I mean i you know i think everybody in fact i had a chat with one of the physios who, who we actually took on board in the last year and when he arrived at the beginning of the last year almost the same time as i did we brought him in um from from the academy and up to the first team he just remembered that the the morning well there wasn't a morning meeting Right. so you know like the simple things you know i mean it's not it's not rocket science but you know just to make sure everybody checks in in the morning was something that i took for granted at arsenal you know we had a meeting every morning it was the same time we knew we shouldn't be late for it i set that up at, at sparta because i need i needed to know the information you know and when i asked for it like with some one-to-ones with the staff as i went through the first couple of weeks trying to learn what was going on you know i spent hours after hours talking to people and you find out what's going on you find out that there's a complaint between between this com communication link and the interaction between this department and another department and maybe you know those things you just people just give you that information what was really important then was to bring that together and and simple stuff like when i asked for it there was an injury audit but it was on one of the computers when i asked for fitness data it was on someone else's computer so you know i mean i i am um, a shameless plug but i brought in edge 10 because we we use them at arsenal and i wanted an athlete management system and we had a different gps system at the time and i'd used stats boards at arsenal so again i got on the phone immediately and i said right we need you know Yes, we need the technology, but the reason for the technology is we want accurate information and we want to store it in one place where it's, there's some transparency and ability to share and, and also to create some accountability. Um, and I tried to remain hands off for about eight weeks, but it lasted about three days <laughs> before I uh, before I found there was a, there's a disagreement between how long an injury, had, 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 you know, what time frame since the injury had occurred and there was a difference of opinion between uh, the, the departments if you like um and then after that they they knew quite quickly that you know we needed to understand exactly what the healing time frames were exactly what the loading parameters were and all the rest of it so there it was it was simple it was the end product of that and the interesting thing was the coach at the time was going mad because he had about three different people coming to him with different information in the mornings and i know that sounds obvious and i don't want to you don't want to criticize but that's that's how it had become um and that's you know coach can't do his job if he's worrying about you know, how many players are on the pitch how, you know it's mm. just it's just streamline streamline that communication channel everything's coming through me from now on, like it or lump it, whether you're a doctor or a you know head of your own department, this is the way it's going to be from now on. And it was a bumpy change, um, but when everybody looks back now, they're you know very pleased that we've gone to the level we've got. The other thing I'll add is that in the last fourteen months, we're on our fourth coaching team. Right. Oh wow. 
just to have another so, spanner in the works. <laughs> interim interim changes as well. So th we're on our third coach and his and his assistant coaches, but there was an interim team as well who took over uh, to sort of steady the ship before the start of the season. So not only have you got the change in the personnel happening or the things happening within the performance team, you've also got building the relationship, you know, starting another relationship with another set of coaches, which which of course means you've got to educate again. And the education piece is, is absolutely massive to get your way of working and your philosophy to, to you know, to be able to influence in, in that direction, whilst also understanding the way that they want to play, the way that they want to work. So that's been a real, a real challenge. All in a country where you don't speak the language. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. Did you have any help on a day-to-day -day basis with someone who does speak Czech or not? Yeah, we, yeah. My, one of my, my head fitness coach is, you know, Slovakian guy, he's been at the club for 10 years, fluent English, he's, you know, he works at the local faculties, he's, um, you know, he's a, he's a good guy and I take him in if there's something that is re really needs and requires in-depth understanding to make sure there's no there's nothing lost in translation I'll, I'll take him in with me yeah absolutely and we'll prepare and we have our morning meeting then we'll go into the coaches so the the workflow has changed significantly as well yeah and, and it's just all it is is about making sure people not have the information that they need to do their jobs mm. yeah nice mate so just going on to a, another topic which comes up all the time in the podcast and i'm not going to apologize for going over it again with with someone else it's always good to get different perspective on how people think and beliefs and things like that and that's hamstring injuries so in terms yeah. of prevention or risk mitigation or any other fancy term that we want to use not basically not having players get hamstring injuries what's your i suppose overarching belief and how you go about trying to trying to do that yeah i think i think you've actually i think the last time we spoke a lot about hamstring injuries and i yeah. think at the time at the time i was in conversations using my arsenal badge to leverage conversations with david opar you know i instead of read his papers i'd just pick up the phone um and that's my that's my modus operandi if you like is just why would i read a paper on something when mm -hmm. i could just go to source yeah. And the conversations we had probably, you know, he would say, I met up with him a couple of years ago, he would say actually shaped some of the work that they were doing because we were dealing with hamstrings. We had, a, you know, a decent injury list in some of those years and we had a, 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 a problem that we needed to solve. And so we went and tried to solve it. So the reason why I'm saying that is because there are better people than me who've done yeah massive studies in PhDs and all the rest of it on on um, on hamstring injuries and I, I'm just an interpreter of that research and have to try and grab and filter what I want and put it into place in my own environment. Um, that said, I like to keep things really simple um, and one simple thing is yes we use the Nord board um, to measure our our players against industry standards you know so there's a nice uh, infographic which has been done by Vald based on a lot of their data from Champions League and Premier League yeah. and we know where we sit as a team average compared to those team averages from those European teams so benchmarking is really important for us you know and over 66% of our squad are above those standards um, which is fantastic and only one person dropped below the line in terms of like a 337 cutoff which was the original cutoff mm -hmm. from the from the research yeah. and that's probably because he got tested at the end of a first week of pre-season okay so you know the interpretation of that value he's probably one of our most robust players but he just had a bad test okay so firstly hamstring strength um yeah and then secondly is exposure to speed and the hamstring strength stuff in terms of programming, um, I've got a ex world champion boxer who's my one of my S and C coaches, and he's in the gym. And so, if we say we're going to do Nordic hamstrings, then they're going to get done. <laughs> <laughs> Absolute and, hard as nails. <laughs> hard as nails. Yeah. Great bloke, but hard as nails. And also, like the compliance out here is phenomenal. So, if you want something done, you're not dealing with. Uh, 
you know, perhaps people who would disagree in other walks of life. Be careful what I say there. <laughs> um, but since coming over here, the compliance is excellent. And so that we do our Nordics, we sometimes do them in corridors after matches, you know, and because we built that base up and people have bought into it now, people don't find it a problem and we do them as regularly as we can so that, you know, hamstring force production doesn't suffer. So we build it up in the off season and we maintain and build in pre-season. And, you know, our Nordic scores, uh, our Nord board scores have gone up 20% since July, right? Which is, which is a nice thing to be able to say as a, as a stat. But the the actual outcome of that is we've we haven't had a time loss hamstring injury in 14 months right. in a professional football team, uh, which is something I'm very proud of and our team should be very proud of because of the process. The other part of that, as I was going to say, is the, is the exposing people to speed and through educating the coaches here, we try and make sure that people every seven to 10 days are exposed to 95 percent of their maximum. If we can get it in drills, we get it in drills or big pitch or whatever we want to do. If we don't get it there, we get the live iPad out and we go, right, you're just, you're just running, fellas. And, um, you know, once they hit their dose that we're happy with for that week, to, based on position as well as um, sort of individual injury history, once they've hit that, we yank them and we get them to move on to the next thing. But if they haven't hit it, then we make them we make them do it. And I believe that the combination of those two factors really is, is the key thing um, to maintaining a decent hamstring health. At the same time, um, we keep a good eye on the training loads. So, you know, I think speaking to David Opar back in the day, 70% we put down to kind of training load in our conversations, you know, right. so managing that piece was really important. And then when you had a spike in load, could you buffer against it by influencing all of those kind of um, modifiable risk factors? Um, and the way we would choose to do that in our cohort and our, our players is to just smash out Nordics um, for most players. Uh, you know, it, it really is that simple. Let's talk about post-match Nordics because that's maybe <laughs> been touched on before, but not gone into super lot, lots of detail. And maybe it doesn't. It's not necessary to go into lots of detail here. But what did you introduce that at Sparta Prague, or was that in previous club, uh, previous club at Arsenal? And what was the buying like? At what what um, what triggers the need for that? Is there a certain um, number of times they're exposed to it in a week and therefore the only time you can get it in is after a game tell, tell us a little more about that yeah so a few things there I think at Arsenal we tried to you know we, certainly with, with Shad Forsyth and Barry Solan at Arsenal coming in there players who hadn't played a full match would, would you know do their, do their leg strength work at the stadium after a game and the, the things you can do is up to you. But, you know, within the changing room, you can do a Nordic and you can do a Bulgarian and you can do an RDL probably. So that, that was easy to do and something that some players did. Um, but when I came here, it was more about the exactly as you say, the making sure they get that regular dose in based on you know the research that would suggest that if you don't maintain that, things are going to change, you know, from a architectural point of view but also from a force production point of view um, and I think also if you did that immediately and you hadn't built up to it in a pre-season of course there'd be problems and issues with recovery but it was finding the right time in the week to do Nordics and if you played you know we played in some of the Europa stages early stages of Europa if you're playing three games a week you know you can't you can't do a, a set of Nordics two days before a game really in some players and so we tried to literally just go right well it's a high day we're going to smash in the nordics as well and then we're going to recover hard for the next couple of days and, and and get them back up to the level where they're going to perform again the idea is that you leave a three-day window before they're going to really expose themselves to a high volume of high intensity mm -hmm. and that's yeah. exactly the same not exactly the same but similar with um with the high speed running and the, and the sprint exposures, you do some after a game. We do some after a game, not necessarily for the guys that have played, but for the for the guys that hadn't, just to make the most of that sometimes time that's actually lost. 
Cause game day. Yeah, we will now. Yeah. Because uh, we've got we've got a basketball schedule coming up. Yes. So um so so yeah we'll we'll see how good our hamstrings are over the next month or so but yeah. um yeah I think the the important thing is almost to keep people on the same rhythm and if you're going to be playing every three days or t- you know three games in a week if you like or three games in eight seven or eight days then there's no good time. You know, and, and people have different ways of doing it. And our way is to do it after ma- after matches. And it's an optional thing, you know, so we don't go and say that you have to do them. Maybe we do because the boxing uh, <laughs> straight, yeah. straight yeah, coaches on. Are, gives them the option. Yeah, <laughs> gives them the option. Will you, you're doing your audits. Yeah. Um, but um, yeah, the compliance is, is incredible. And, and of course, if someone's tight or they've had a high exposure and they don't want to do it, then we don't we don't make them do it. And we just note down that they haven't done it. Mm-hmm. So, that, what, so what kind thing. of in terms of Nordics, what kind of volumes are we looking at after after uh, if, we, if you can uh, do it after games? After games, you know, two threes. Okay. That's all. Yeah. 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 So just making sure that it's a four to five second rep, not a not a falling over clap push up. Mm-hmm. Um, and if on occasion guys who are willing to do it some of them have cramped up of course we stop it immediately then so there's a you know you can see the the trade-off there is are we are we assisting with adaptation or are we you know adding unnecessary load to these players but so far if the output is whether we've had a hamstring injury or not um, and whether players have managed to maintain or get stronger then on those two you know, counts. We've done pretty well and it seems to be working, but obviously now we're going to put that under a little bit of stress. See how good you've been. Yeah. <laughs> so, I'm glad we did the podcast now, actually, to be honest. Because, I know. Because, yeah, if we did part three in about a month and a half's time, I'd, you probably wouldn't be able to find me for a podcast. <laughs> but, yeah, we'll see. We'll see. So the next thing I want to chat about is is definitely your forte. And where I kind of creep back and shrivel and feel really uncomfortable talking about certain things that I certainly know very little, well, not very little, but um, horrendously amounts less than you about, and that's shoulders. So we touched on this two and a half years ago, but the ash test. Give us the yeah. the background and the work that went behind that and what it actually is, then we'll we'll use that as a bit of a jumping off point. All right, that's cool. Yeah, the last. When I spoke to you last time, I was so cagey about it. It was horrible, but I felt like I, I was really careful about not publicising something that we didn't know anything about. Yep. Right. We had some initial good findings. So, so the test is basically an isometric three-second maximal test. Um, in terms of seeing it or looking at videos you know i've done some webinars on it and i've uh, it, there's some stuff online as well which we can link to mm-hmm. but um but essentially it's a prone lying test in three positions and a long lever position so an eye test a y test and a t test so kind of 180 degrees in fact i can show you kind of a 180 mm-hmm. a 135 and a 90 degree position lying prone yeah um and the 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 test itself came from a conversation with some really good people at Saracens. So it was Paddy Hogben, strength and conditioning coach, Laura Tullock, um, is a physio, uh, Daniel Cohen, who's my go-to force person, and uh, I'd done a lot of work with him at Arsenal, and then Nav Singh, who was um, you know the data analyst or sports scientist at Arsenal, who was helping us with the daily monitoring. So all those heads were better than one, and we basically we're looking at the fact that Sarri's had some issues around quantifying end stage return to play prior to going into kind of long lever tackling. And they were doing a load of handheld dynamometer testing. They would look at gym based markers and they were guys who were super strong, who could produce force with short levers, who when they were exposed to long lever tackles or arm grab tackles would have symptoms of instability or actually pain and would break down. So it was finding a way of quantifying that. So I think I was at St. George's Park at the time and I, had a, I might have actually had a beer map, but it, you know, it, it was definitely drawn up on the back of a beer map. And then when I got back to Arsenal, I did some pilot work on my, my N equals one self. And it seemed to make a lot of sense and it fitted with the hamstring isometrics we were doing at the time. 
Anyway, then the Saris guys, the team there, ran with it. And what they did was they did a lot of pilot work on a number of people. And we met as a group to discuss what they were finding and how we could modify that quite regularly. Good learning for all of us, really, um, around this problem solving. And so at the end of the day, they found a lot of stuff in their pilot testing that, that was of great interest. So historical shoulder problems that had big asymmetries or guys who you know, passed certain tests but didn't pass others, or guys coming back from surgery who at certain stages were having definite deficits still that weren't even, uh, some of them they did in the pilot study, who then became injured, they then had a pre-injury benchmark for so they could use that. So mm. long story short, we had a number of case studies that showed really interesting stuff. And I think that was about the time I spoke to you. Um, yeah, I don't think you can... Oh. I don't think you can mention Saracens when we spoke. No, I, I think I you don't have to keep that could. here. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I don't think I, I could. And, and the guys there have been really good about like sharing the information. Mm. You know, uh, as long as it's de-identified, you know, we published it. I mean, we published mm. it as a reli a non-sexy reliability piece. But that was I was determined to get that done to show that it worked and could give you reliable data. Because from my world at the time, that was so important. Mm. Um. But what I really wanted to get onto was sharing it so that people could apply it. And what's happened since then is, you know, I mean, yeah, I'm trying to use a word that isn't viral, but you know, it, it, it's it's essentially I'm getting I'm getting emails pinging pinged with emails from from you know, volleyball coaches in 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 various countries like sevens teams, you know, women's sevens in New Zealand, you know, wherever it is, who are asking about this test now because it's out there in the public domain. Um, Daniel Cohen and I have written a BGSM editorial about basically rate of force development and using that as one test as part of a cluster of tests, like with a plyometric push up with the original handheld dynamometry stuff or using a force frame. You know, it, it, it fills a knowledge gap. There's a this long lever test seems to hit stuff that others other tests don't. Mm -hmm. And it is very applicable uh, to people I have conversations with in Major League Baseball um you know talking to tennis and british tennis it's very applicable and now we've got some really interesting information from a number of studies that not only looks at injury risk when compared to this but also stacks up um against performance markers yeah so it's 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 growing all the time it's not at the stage of lower body literature and and understanding but it's it's this area that i'm really keen on making sure we we uh you know build and develop the ideas as fast as we can mm -hmm. one thing i saw the other day and I, I put it on the on the email that I, I fired over the message that i fired over was the force hooks is that what they call force hooks? yes yes because there's an image yeah. of the guy i think i think it might have been a girl on lying prone on the bench and yeah yeah could that could that be utilized instead of a force play because i'm i'm guessing that you might tell me wrong but i don't think this product's out yet but they're doing a lot of bit of publicity around it and Maybe cheaper That's option right. than a force plate. Yeah, so I already told you I'm. I already told you I'm straight to the point. I've yeah. called. I called. I called them up and I yeah. wanted to chat because actually they put the ash test using a bar prone using the, the force hooks, mm -hmm. and I had a good good conversation about that. So it comes back to the thought process. You know, okay. we decided to do it in those positions using a force platform because it was stable. It takes out human error. And also it gives you RFD, which other, other tests don't. So they'll give you peak force, but it won't give you RFD. So as a compromise, something like a handheld dynamometer can be used. Even a SFIG cuff, so the squeeze cuff that okay. we use for adductors, yep. can be used because I've supervised an MSC project that looked at the correlation between the force platform and the ASH test and, um, and the SFIG cuff just so that it can get out to the wider population. But ultimately, you're missing a big piece of the puzzle, which is rate of force development. Yeah. Um, we'll come back to know, that in a minute. I, just remind myself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, no worries. And I think that the, the other thing about that to say is there's some guys who have sunken force platforms just by their facilities. Mm -hmm. And they've used a dumbbell on the platform in the same positions just because they see the value of the positions. As long as you standardize and do your own internal validation on your test and it's reliable and repeatable, then... Yeah, it, I'm, I'm not saying it's the right or wrong thing to do. I'm just saying that, you know, we're building a body of knowledge around one thing. We standardize that and we know it works. 
how you decide to apply it with your own cohort of athletes. I've got the uh, I've got the force platforms in my flat from the last few weeks, and I've been playing around with different angles. So you know, just in terms of ball release for for baseball, and yeah, there's some other bits and pieces I'm playing around with for my PhD when that kind of kicks back in. But um, yeah, I'm I'm not precious about it being the only test. It's just interesting, I think, looking at longer levers. Um, and what that relates to, yeah. Who are the guys behind the Force Hooks? Seems like you've spoken to them. Is it independent? Uh, Jason, yeah, uh, Jason is um, the main guy, and he's uh, developed that. He's working uh, with um, Sophie Nymphius, I believe, okay. and uh, yeah, they're working down there in Australia. Yeah, um, yeah and. You know, again, I, as I understand it, that's going to be at some point in the next few months is going to be available. I think they're just making some, you know, uh, last minute sort of modifications to the product before the launch. Yeah, nice. So back to RFD. Why so? Why so important? Yeah. Why so important? Well, all the meaningful actions of injury and performance happen in a very short time window, and um, you know, if you look at lower limb literature, which is Basically, what I'm doing is I'm hacking into lower limb stuff that's already been done and then trying to apply it to the upper mm, body, absolutely. which makes sense to me. Um, if you look at a if you look at a drop jump, you know, athletes can't necessarily perform a decent drop jump the day after a game in football, but they can probably do a reasonably normal counter movement jump. So if you give people longer to produce force, then not anybody can do it, but you know, you, you can you can get away with it. You can you can still perform in tests. So the reason for the RFD stuff is that in in my eyes, it's a sensitive marker of fatigue, and it's something that can be, whilst it's quite a volatile metric in a number of areas, and as you know, in the literature, if you look at it, if you've got um, a coefficient of variation of under fifteen percent in your RFD, you're probably doing pretty well. We've seen RFD in the ASH test of 5% across four trials, you know, so the, the most important thing just on that is the familiarization and the education around it before you go in cold and try and do it. But the RFD is, um, you know, it's it's not how big a muscle is, it's how quickly you can switch it on at the right place in the right time. And it probably talks to the neural elements of force production a little bit more than it does to the architectural components of force production um, and all this knowledge comes from again a conversation where I read a 20 page Nick Maffioletti paper and then I called him up because Alan McCall had his number and he was gracious enough to give me 60 minutes of his time which was some of the best learning on RFD that you can get firsthand from the man himself and he said there's not a lot of stuff being done in upper limb RFD mm. and it was true when I looked at the research but to get the best out of that test you really need to understand rate of force development before you go down that route of looking at it yeah as yeah. a variable so this will be the last question before i let you shoot on we get on with your evening where next where next for this area i know you've mentioned uh, the phd when that kicks back in but where next in this area for you well i've maintained conversations around my athletic shoulder business with with baseball with um you know the lta with uh rugby teams so I think the first thing is understanding where we're at. So you know, people sort of want to go to the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. But firstly, let's let's capture what we've already got. We've got a number of really interesting case studies there um, around just the ash test, but also how the ash test interacts with other measures that people are generally doing, like one RMs in the gym, like you know, connection from from CMJs to an upper limb test of you know rate of force and force mm -hmm. or maybe there's something in that you know okay. and certainly the project i'm working in with the lta on there is is around transfer of force and if you're not utilizing and storing and optimizing your force production from the lower body then you're basically catching up and overloading through your shoulder so if you've got all that information already and most teams do it's then the understanding of how to put it together and then match that up against injury and match that up against performance and i think that it's it's a pretty easy step to do 
but you need to have a little bit of foresight to start to collect that information to then stack that up over a few seasons to see what happens with it. And maybe we need to pull some data from a couple of teams now um, who are using ash testing alongside other markers to do what we're doing with lower body, which is which is the norm, you know, looking at squat, looking at percentage body weight, looking at absolute and relative values. How do they all interact? Um, and that's probably the next step for us. So are you actively looking for people who are using the ash test to kind of pull things together and get in touch and share information and whatnot? Yeah, I yeah. absolutely love it. Yeah. Uh, I, I reply, <laughs> I reply to every email. I've been zooming the life out of it as well. I'm trying to create an opportunity, and I've been doing some webinars with people just sharing what we know, you know, within the constraints of what you can share within organisations. But um, but my own personal development around is re it's really interesting. Like how do, how do people utilise it? Uh, it? It was a it was a thought process we came up with as a as a group and it's worked for what we were trying to solve. But then how a, how's um, a guy in Spanish volleyball looking at it? And he looked he looked against the spike velocity against ash test RFD right. and found some really interesting, uh, you know, associations, we'll call them because I don't want to go down that route, but of saying it's correlated, but there's some very strong relationships. Um, working as a consultant for the Toronto Blue Jays, which I can say, with Clive Brewer and Angus, um, I was in-house in spring training for five days and, and we'd already looked at one year's worth of information around their their athletes and their players before we then tested them again. Um, you know, 75 players and we'd looked at 92 people who threw a fastball the year before. So we know a, a decent amount about how that that relates in that sport, but also not just in that sport, but in that organisation you know, which is really important around their own athletes yep. um, about how that information might transfer to help them answer some questions. Amazing. Where, where can people, if, if people are interested in being involved, where, where's the best place to, to contact you? And I suppose on a global level, whatever, if it's ash test and, yeah. and shoulder stuff or it's anything else we've spoken about, where's the best, people, best place for people to get in touch? Well, I think, you know, from my side, uh, you can email me, my Ben at athleticshoulder.com is easy. You can go through my social channels. Um, so Ben Ashworth on Twitter or Athletic Shoulder on Instagram, if that's easier for you. Um, or I'm on LinkedIn. So whichever you come at me with, um, probably an email's the best. Awesome. Well, I'm going to let you get on with your evening. What what time is it there? Are you at how many hours in front of you? Well, we're, um, what are we on? Seven seven twenty here. Oh, okay. So we're an hour, we're an hour ahead. Okay. And um, if, before I go, and we mentioned this before, actually, and you know that I've got a podcast of my own up and running. Oh, yes. Sorry. Sorry. Apologies. That's yes. That's okay. That's okay. You know, I know you see it as massive competition. <laughs> no, <it's>... um, <laughs> so you, you were trying to cut me off before I plugged it. <laughs> right. Finish there. Finish there. Stop. stop. <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, um, it's important. I say it because uh, first, firstly, thank you to you, because when I phoned you up and asked you, how to set up a podcast, which I'd always wanted to do. Yeah. Um, you gave me all the advice in the world, uh, you know, that you had available and you, you've gone on to massive things and we're at the start of ours, but it's informed performance podcast. Mm -hmm. um, there's 29 episodes out there at the moment on all the normal channels. And the main thing to say is I couldn't do it on my own. So I met a really good guy who's a dual qualified S&C coach and, and physio, Andy McDonald, who's now doing his doctorate out in Philadelphia. So he's the voice slash face of the podcast at the moment. Um, and, you know, you can go on Instagram and inform performance and you can go on Twitter, inform pod. Um, and we've tried to, wherever possible, not to interview guests that have been on Pacey Performance. If I'm honest. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so that we don't try not to duplicate. But I think there's been some really nice, uh, nice things on there. Nice stuff. I'm making notes on a couple of them recently um myself on a few runs around prague so yeah worth worth a listen at this time absolutely i spoke to andy the other day and it was good to catch up with him and just share journeys i i, I like it like i know you made, you made a bit of a joke of it but the, the more the merrier like the more podcasts can become the norm of you know education entertainment whatever it may be and i think that that is happening but i'm happy to help yeah. anyone out there like i stuck on social media the other day i'm happy to help anyone there's been probably I think I've probably had four chats in the last two weeks 
with people who are reasonably serious, I think, about about setting them up or having them already. So I'm I'm delighted. I like, bring it on. Yeah, it's just a really nice way of, of well, it's a really nice way of networking and yeah. and the connections from that, as you know, uh, and uh, Andy's Andy's gonna be going to be great in in some professional sport in the us at some point in the coming years once he's finished his doctorate um but for him obviously for me to be able to introduce him to my network but also um you know he's a sharp guy so you know his questions his questions are the, are the questions of loads of all of us who are sitting awesome. around there who who are you know who, who would love that opportunity to sit with these guys and and, and talk and, and you know it's been actually one thing we've done really, I think, quite well is we've hit we've hit a lot of the really good female, um, uh, you know, practitioners in sport. Yeah. You know, a lot of our early episodes ended up being, uh, you know, basically guys who are working in really elite jobs in often male dominated environments mm-hmm. and who, who've been made a massive success of it. So that was that was something, again, you know, pretty proud of being yeah, a father sure. of a daughter. Yeah, know, so. yeah. No, absolutely. That's, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. Cool. Well, I'll link to all that stuff, all your papers and uh, the, the podcast as well, of course, um, and on the, on the website. And so people can use that as a bit of a resource to, to jump off from. But thank you very much for your time. Enjoy that wine that I can see over your left shoulder. And enjoy <laughs> your steak. Enjoy your steak. <laughs> Yeah, will do, mate. Look, thanks very much for having me on. And, uh, you know, that's um, it's been good fun. It's been good fun again. Pleasure. Thanks, mate. Speak soon.